Hello everyone and welcome to Cherry Avenue Christian Church Online. Thank you for taking the time to worship with us today. And we haven't mentioned this in a while, but please make sure to let us know you're watching by dropping a comment or emailing us and letting us know you're watching. It's always a big encouragement to us when we hear from you. Well, before we get to our worship and our message, let me tell you about some of the great stuff happening here. Next Sunday, August 29th, from 1 to 3 p.m., we're going to have a family water fun event in the parking lot. It's going to be water game kits that you can keep and take home, or you can enjoy them here and you can take them home then. They're going to be, there's going to be free ice cream, so please plan to bring your kids and grandkids next Sunday and enjoy this fun time with them as summer comes to a close. Now, on Wednesday, September 1st at noon, we're going to have a prayer luncheon. We're going to eat and come together for a dedicated time of prayer for our country, our community, and our church. And we'll wrap up about 1245 so you can get back to work. Prayer is so important to everything we do, and I hope you'll be sure to join us on September 1st as we come together to pray. And September 12th, we'll kick off our fall with a fellowship lunch after the worship service in the Family Life Center. It's going to be a great time, so bring your favorite dish and join us for worship and then a meal afterward on September 12th. Well, as we come to our prayer time today, we want to lift up D.B., who had a procedure this past week. We want to pray for her as she recovers and, and moves on to the next step for her. Also want to pray for Harv A. as he has eye surgery Tuesday. We want to pray for his surgery and his recovery. We also want to lift up Donna B. as she's been diagnosed with cancer. And Shane K., we want to lift him up in prayer as he had cancer surgery Friday and is recovering from that. And I would ask that you pray for my father, Wayne, as he's having surgery to remove some cancer on Wednesday. Well, let's pray together. Father, we praise you for all you are and all you do. You bless us so incredibly. And I know we don't show our gratitude as often as we should, but we are grateful for what you do for us. And we thank you for your care for our needs. As we lift up these names to you today, Lord, we ask that you would work in their situations and that you would do what's best for each of them. We ask for healing if it's your will, but most of all, we ask that these times of difficulty would be moments that would lead them to an even closer relationship with you as you walk with them through it. Lord, we pray that you would be with us with everything we face, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in our series, Tall Tales, where we're looking at the lies of the enemy that he tries to get us to believe. And after a time of worship through song, we'll have part two, Do It Yourself. Yeah. 
I grew up during the height of the televangelist era, and there was a lot of pie-in-the-sky type preaching that focused on the goodness of God and the need to give, most specifically to them. I don't think I ever heard anyone on TV talk about tithing to your local church, but if you could, to support them with something afterward. The plea was always for their ministry specifically. But the preaching on God often focused on John 10.10, 10. and what you'd usually see is this quote this way. It said, I have come that they may have life and may have it to the full. Abundant life. That's why Jesus came. What a truth. That's the kind of thing you want to focus on to start your day. You just want to reach out and hold on to that with both hands. But that's not the whole verse. If you look at the beginning of the way it was usually shown, you see an ellipsis, three little dots that are supposed to mean that something was left out that doesn't alter the meaning of what, what's quoted. But that's not the case when it comes to this particular verse. That first half of the verse is very important. Now, I've quoted just the second half of the verse before when the context was appropriate. I've also quoted just the first half of the verse <clears throat> when it was appropriate. But it's important to see both because there are some pretty significant words in that first half of the verse. Here's what precedes the promise of Jesus that he came to bring us abundant life. The first part of John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Now that's not quite as feel good as the second part of the verse, is it? It's not fun to think about the fact that we have an enemy and his goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. But if we only teach that Jesus came to give us abundant life, then we don't explain that there's a spiritual battle we're fighting and that we have an enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy that abundant life, then we're going to have real trouble. Because we're going to be walking around thinking, well, life's just supposed to be a vacation, when there's really a battle going on. So the truth is that Jesus did come so we could experience abundant life. And the enemy would like you to just kind of focus on that and ignore the rest to just place an ellipsis there and not think about the fact that, there, that he's there to kill and steal and destroy. Now in this series, we're looking at some of the more prominent lies that he's gotten many of us to believe. We believe them because it's what we always heard growing up and we've just accepted them. Maybe we believe them because a lot of other people believe them and we don't want to be the only one who says, um, I, I don't think that's true. But when we live by a lie, we give it the power of truth in our life. And so it, it acts like it's true, even though it's not. And every day, the enemy throws lies at us, lies about our identity, lies about God, lies about his love for us, lies about how life works, just lie after lie after lie. And what we said last week was that when we believe a lie, we live by a lie. And when we live by a lie, we give it the power of truth in our life. And we use the kind of silly but true example of carrots and how many of us have either eaten or gotten our kids to eat carrots based on the promise that they'll give them good eyesight, except that that's not true. It came from World War II propaganda put out by the British to cover for the fact that they had designed onboard radar for their planes and they didn't want the Germans to know they had developed that technology. That campaign got picked up in the U.S., including by writers for Bugs Bunny, <laughs> And before long, everybody believed carrots gave us better vision, which isn't true. But we believed it, so it had the same power over our lives as it would have if it were true. But it wasn't. So what are some more significant ways this comes into play, where the enemy tells us lies and it impacts our lives? Maybe you believe the lie that God doesn't care about you. And because you believe that, uh, that he doesn't care about you, you've let your heart become hard toward him and you've become bitter. Or maybe you believe the lie that you can never change. You hear the whisper, you know, that's just the way you are. You've always been that way. You always will be that way. It's too late for you. And if you believe that lie, then you're not even going to try to change. You're just going to go deeper and deeper into it and things will only get worse. Maybe you believe the lie that money would make you happy. And so you've just focused all your time and energy to that. 
hoping more money would make you happier. You see, when we believe a lie, it has a huge effect on our life. And so in this series, we want to expose some of the lies we hold on to that have an adverse effect on our life, and we want to come to embrace the truth that will set us free. And so this week, we're going to look at the DIY lie, the I can fix it myself lie. You know, DIY stands for do it yourself. And for some things, it can be a great way to save some money, you know, if you know what you're doing. There's the key. There's an entire cable network called the DIY network, all about these types of projects. There are millions of YouTube videos that can be very helpful. The trick is knowing the difference between the things you can do yourself and the things that you can't. It takes a bit of self-awareness because it's different for different people. When we first moved into our house here, we were reminded of one of the things I've never understood about home construction, and that's that many homes, at least homes built in the area, era that my home was, <coughs> excuse me, weren't built with a light in the middle of the living room. It's never made sense to me. But I wanted a light in the middle of the living room, so I tried to put in a ceiling fan with the light. My sister-in-law did the bulk of the work. She's an electrician. But I almost burned down the first house I ever owned less than a month after moving in. I had to call one of our guys who's an electrician to come and check it out because there was smoke coming out of it. It wasn't from what my sister-in-law did. It was from what I did. And I learned pretty quickly. There are a lot of things I just can't fix. I love the ad I heard on the radio for a handyman service. It said, we repair what your husband fixed. <laughs> you know that came from listening to a bunch of wives who said, well, we had a slow drip in the faucet. Then my husband fixed it. Now the bathroom's flooded. And it's not just home repairs. Therapists and recovery groups could have a, a sign that says, we help you stop doing that thing that you can stop anytime you want because it isn't a problem. You know? The I can fix it myself lie is the lie of pride. It's the lie that causes us to not ask for help when we need it. It's a lie that makes us desperate to cover up mistakes and not admit fault or not admit that we can't. And the enemy knows that if he can get us to buy the you can fix it yourself lie, that it'll look like God's not necessary. For some people, when you say I can fix it myself, the it isn't necessarily referring to an inanimate object, right? It may be a person for you. You may be sitting next to your it right now. And you know it's your job to fix it. There are so many people who've convinced themselves their job is to fix people. And I just want to ask, how's that working out for you? When you find your identity in that, you measure your success or your failure by their successes or failures. And it creates a spirit of pride or insecurity. Or maybe your it isn't a person. Maybe it's a financial situation or an addiction, or a marriage, or a health issue, or a broken relationship, or a secret sin. And the enemy whispers, you don't need any help. You can handle this yourself. You don't need to let anyone know about your struggle. They'll just think you're weak. Give it a little longer. You can fix it. You don't need anybody else. God doesn't care. There are so many other problems in the world. He doesn't care about what you're going through right now. You don't need him. You can fix it yourself. That's the lie. And I think it's especially prevalent in cultures like the, U the U.S. where we celebrate independence and a kind of a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality. That's been our culture for over 200 years. There's something within us that believes we can fix anything ourselves. It's natural. How many of you, some of your kids' earliest words were, myself, I do it myself? Or how about the phrase, I got this? I got this. You know, nothing good ever comes after someone says, I got this. It's not going to end well. You know disaster's looming. It's like, here, hold my beer. You know trouble's coming. And the Bible gives us a number of examples of what this looks like when we buy into this idea that we don't need any help. In Genesis 16, Abraham and Sarah are told that you're going to have a son who's going to be the beginning of a great nation, even though Sarah is well beyond childbearing age. And time passes and there's no baby, so Sarah figures God needs help. So she decides to fix it herself and tells Abraham, go sleep with my servant. Maybe we can build a family through her. And the servant gets pregnant, but then so does Sarah. 
and there's all this drama and conflict. In fact, so much of the conflict between Muslims and Jews and Christians right now can be traced back to Abraham and Sarah deciding we can fix this ourselves. We don't need God's help. I was reading just last week in 1 Samuel 13 in my quiet time where King Saul has what looks like a great opportunity to attack the Philistines, but the window is closing. So he's waiting for the priest Samuel to come and offer sacrifices and ask God for help before going into battle. But Samuel's running a little late, so Saul decides, I'm not going to wait for Samuel to come and just ask for God's help. He's just going to do it himself. And this is it for Saul. God lets Saul know through Samuel that because of his defiant act of independence, he's going to lose his kingdom. It's going to be given to a man after God's own heart, David. And when you look at the New Testament, you see it with some false teachers called the Judaizers. And one of the primary lies of these false teachers was that Jesus was good, but he's not enough. You need to do some of it yourself. And you need to work hard enough and keep the right rules. And if you do that, then you'll be okay. And the enemy tells us this lie that we can fix it ourselves because he knows if he can get us to believe it, eventually things are going to come crashing down for us. Just like my house almost did when I tried installing a ceiling fan or doing my part of installing a ceiling fan. So here's what happens when we buy into the lie. For one, it increases pride. I don't need anyone or anything else. And the longer I go without recognizing that I need help, the higher the stakes get. Another consequence when we buy into the I can fix it mentality is that it minimizes legitimate problems or legitimate challenges. It makes us look at things and say, it's okay, it's not a big deal. And Satan would love that. He would love for you to look at your drinking problem or your spending problem or your lust problem and think, you know, it's, it's really not a big deal. Another thing that happens when we buy into this lie is it feeds guilt. Because what happens is that a lot of us have this mentality that says, I made this mess, I need to clean it up. And it comes from a legitimate place. When I spilled something as a kid, my mom would say, you made the mess, you need to clean it up. That is, if I spilled my drink on the kitchen floor, which was tile or linoleum. But if I spilled it on carpet, well, that was, there was more there that needed to be done that I hadn't learned how to do properly yet. There's a procedure for getting that right. I couldn't clean that up properly when I was young. But if we don't recognize that there are some messes we make that we can't clean up by ourselves, we develop this huge amount of guilt and we think, what's wrong with me? And we live with this weight, this guilt in our life. Another thing buying into the lie does is that it worsens the fallout. If you keep believing, I can fix this myself, you're going to come to a point where you can hear yourself saying, I can't believe it got this bad. Doctors will talk about how patients see symptoms, but they think, I, I don't want to be a wimp and complain. And they ignore it until they have a huge problem on their hands, where if they had come to them when they first started seeing the symptoms, something could have been done. You know what else it does? It ruins intimacy in our relationships. It keeps us from opening up to our spouse or to others about our struggles because we're, we're convinced we can or we have to fix it ourselves. It's true in marriages. It's true in churches. God designed the church to be the place where we have the kinds of relationships where we can hold each other accountable and support and encourage one another as we go through our daily struggles. But over the centuries, the church has become the last place where we open up about our struggles. And we shut ourselves off from the relationships that God can use to help us overcome the hurts and the hang-ups and the habits in our life. But what happens when you start asking for help? Well, it makes the person you ask feel very valued. And it lets you feel known that there's somebody who knows what you're going through and what you're struggling with. One of the things that, that I hear the most at Celebrate Recovery is how helpful it is just to know you're not alone, that there are others who understand what you're going through and are praying for you, as well as walking beside you through it. The other thing that happens when we buy into the fix-it-yourself lie is that it breeds hypocrisy. When we're concerned with hiding from others 
what we're struggling with, we build this facade. We put up a front so nobody will know we haven't fixed the things in our life that need it. And we live hypocritically. This lie hurts our relationships. It hurts us spiritually because it cuts us off from the help that we need and we just deny. Listen to what God says in Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14. It says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. It says Jesus is our high priest. Well, okay, that sounds nice, but it doesn't mean a lot to those of us in 2021. But to his audience, it was huge, because the high priest to the Jewish people was the advocate. He was their representative to God. He spoke to God on their behalf. And this says, this is Jesus. He represents you. He's in heaven sitting at the right hand of God, speaking to God on your behalf. And if that's true, and man, what does that do to the lie that we're told that we have to fix things ourselves? So to counter the DIY lie, we have to remember that Jesus is our advocate before God. He's standing up for us, speaking on our behalf to God. Verse 15 says that he understands our weaknesses. The word in the original language carries with it the idea that he doesn't just watch from a distance and shake his head saying, oh, that's too bad. It carries the idea that he enters into it somehow. The NIV uses the word sympathizes. It's like the difference between turning on the TV and seeing pictures and video of a third world country and standing there yourself. I had seen my dad's pictures of the Philippines, but until I was standing there amid garbage and huts made from scraped together wood and metal scrounged from dilapidated containers and hearing people in abject poverty saying, I'm blessed and I know that I am, I had no idea. There's no comparison. And that's what it says. Jesus has, he has that for our struggles. He gets it. He's been there. He's experienced what we experience. He knows what it's like. So not only is Jesus our advocate, but he understands our situation. And that's huge. Because when he speaks on our behalf, he speaks as one who's been there and knows the temptations and feelings and pressures and pain that we feel. I could go before Congress and I could argue for more stringent laws to protect rape victims or to protect women from becoming rape victims. But I could never be as good an advocate as a woman who survived that horrific experience. I can lobby for better care for veterans, but not nearly as well as someone who is a vet and has dealt with the red tape and the problems the system has. And Jesus is the greatest advocate for us because he lived as one of us. He's been through the temptations and the pain and the pressures that we had. And he can speak on our behalf as one who's been where we are. So because he knows what it's like and because he's our high priest and the son of God, what does that mean in practical terms? What does that look like when we live by that truth? We'll look at verse 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Because we have Christ as our advocate, representing us as someone who completely understands us, we can ask for his help with confidence. Let's come boldly. It's not like applying for a loan where you're not sure if you're going to be approved or not. The idea is that he's for you. He's on your side. He's advocating for you. And so we come to him with confidence asking for help. And that's the challenge. Every day, Satan whispers in some way, you can fix this yourself. You need to fix this yourself. You can't let anyone else know you're struggling. You can't let anyone else know. And we need to stop and approach God boldly. So many people desperately need God's help, and they, and they don't understand why they're not getting it. And it's because they're not approaching him, and they're just waiting for him to come and help. That's not what it says. It says, you come to him boldly. Someone said, God will begin to heal what we reveal, but not what we conceal. When we reveal it, when we come to him boldly and we say, I've got a mess. 
I've got a struggle and I can't fix it myself. And we ask for his help and we invite him into it. He begins to redeem. He begins to heal. And one of the ways he heals is by providing the church so that we have people who will walk alongside us through this if we're willing to open up. It's important to develop close Christian friendships so that you can open up with confidence and let them help. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, he's not talking about confessing to be saved. He's writing to people who are already Christians. But he says, when you start to confess your struggles to each other, you can pray for each other. You can hold each other accountable. You can encourage one another. And when you do that, that's where healing begins. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens. But nobody can help you carry your burden if you don't let them know you have it. Bishop and author William Willman tells of an encounter he once had with a dying woman. He said that she was in the last stages of lung cancer, just gasping day after day for breath. And it was obvious she was in great pain, that she was exhausted from fighting. And he said that when he would go to visit her, she clutched this crucifix she had in her hand. She would just hold on to it daily. And he found out that the crucifix had been given to her by her grandmother when she was a little girl that it was carved by a monk in Europe, and it was just this meaningful symbol of her faith and all that it meant to her. And Willeman says that when he entered the room on that last day, he could see that she was near the end. And so he said to her, would, would you like me to pray for you? W would you like me to summon a priest? And he says that with her last ounce of energy, she held out that crucifix, which depicted the body of Christ nailed to the cross, and she said, thank you but I have a priest. This is Jesus. We talk a lot about Jesus as our Savior and Lord, but he also wants to be our high priest, our advocate, our representative, the person we go to for help. And we can go boldly before the throne of God, knowing that we'll find the grace and the mercy that we need. If you've ever tried to tackle a do-it-yourself project, you quickly find that there are some you can handle, especially with the help of a YouTube video, and some that are beyond your ability to take care of yourself. One thing that, try as we might, we can't handle ourselves is the sin in our life. It's like trying to haul an aircraft carrier in a backpack. It's just too big of a load. And that's why Jesus came. Because being the Son of God, He's the only one who can carry that burden. He's the only one who can tackle that problem. And He did that on the cross. He allowed His body to be beaten and His blood to be spilled to pay the price for the sin in our lives. As we celebrate communion to recognize that sacrifice and thank Him for loving us enough to do that. And so we take the bread and the cup that represent His body and blood. Let's show Him our gratitude and commit to sharing the good news of his love with others. Scripture says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. At the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. goes on to say, in the same way also, <clears throat> he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup together. Let's pray. Lord, words can't express how grateful we are for the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross to pick up the burden that was far too much for us to bear. We thank you so much for loving us enough to do that, and we pray that you would help us to be worthy of that new life that he's provided. And it's in his name that we pray. 
Well, thank you for worshiping with us today. And if you ever want to talk about your relationship with Christ, please don't hesitate to call the office or email me, and I'll be glad to talk with you about that. Have a great week. I hope to see you in person here at 10 o'clock next Sunday. And if you can't be here in person, please join us online. God bless.